这是我们的圣诞节特别小课啊 ，Decision Theory。那么什么是 Decision Theory 呢？它就研究我们如何去做决策。比方说呢，你们开始想，哎，我这个圣诞节我去哪儿玩呢？对吧？啊，你就有一个 Action Space， 就是里面呢，就是你这圣诞节想去的地方啊。比方说，你可以说，你可以去欧洲，你可以去，你可以回亚洲，你可以待在 UK。这是你的所有可能的选择，然后我们要根据我们我们我们这个做这个决策是要收集一些实时数据的，比方说呢，你收集了一些关于每个地方的天气的数据，然后呢，你决定选择一个这个假期期间天气最好的地方来旅游，也就是说你的 decision r o l e 就是 best。当然呢，这里都不是严格的数学符号，但是呢，如果你想要量化你做决策的过程，就有这么三个要素：首先，你有哪些选择；第二，你有什么数据来帮你选择；第三，有了这些数据，我们做什么样的选择？最后，这是一个函数，从你的数据，所有可能的收集到的数据的空间到你的。所有可能的选择，这就是 decision theory 的框架。那么它又为什么可以是一个整个统计、整个统计方法的框架呢？因为我们可以回忆一下我们至今为止学过的那些东西。我们有 point estimation。在我们做 point estimation 的时候呢，我们其实是，比方说你设计了一个 statistics t x， 用来估计你的参数 data。那么我们的我们就是收集到一个数据之后，相当于是我们收集到一个数据之后，我们选择一个参数空间里面的一个参数 t x。所以说，一般来讲，我们的 estimator 其实会写成 data hat， 这样呢就清晰一点。就是说，我们其实是在选择一个 data 这个参数，来根据我们的数据来选择一个参数。所以这是一个 decision。那么这里的 action space 就是我们的参数空间 parameter space， 这个是大写的 data 啊。然后。我们的 decision rule 就是这个函数，你看到它是我们给它一个数据，然后它给我吐出来一个参数空间里面的东西。我们还有在什么时候做决策呢？我们在 hypothesis testing 的时候，其实也是在做决策。那么我们 hypothesis testing 最后就是一个 reject or not 的问题。Um, okay, I'm gonna switch into English now. <laughs> yeah. So, hypothesis testing is also about decision making. You have two, only two options. You either reject your null hypothesis or you accept your null hypothesis. And for simplicity, we will denote them as one and zero. So your action space, or AKA your set of possible decisions, is are just zero and one. So what is this decision that you are making? You give them the data. So we usually define such a function about whether you reject the data or not, depending on whether you know uh, its estimator is in some rejection set. So C is the rejection set, and you reject if your data is in there. Oh, just for simplicity, let's say it's a critical region directly on X. So, if x is in this region, we reject. Otherwise, we accept. So, this is our decision rule. You can see it's and again it's a function from the from the sample space x to your decision space. Sorry, your action space zero and one. Another decision making is about confidence 
interval. So, um, in contrast to point estimation, you, you are doing an interval estimation, which, so given the data, instead of finding a point estimation like theta hat, you find an interval, Cx. Cx is an interval. And so your action space is actually, in this case, the set of all power sets of your parameter space. So yes, it can, not, it can be something other than the interval. Like if you say, if you dig a hole in the middle and say, OK, this part, these two parts are my estimate. So I think my as parameter theta falls in these ranges, uh, not in the middle, that's also possible. Say if you think an event is either extreme or extremely possible or extremely impossible, then this end represents probability zero, that end pro represents probability one, and the probability in the middle, you think it's not quite. So you choose an interval that kind of breaks into two parts, and there are other intervals possible. So that's why we say the action space, instead of just set of intervals, we say it's set of all power sets, i.e. all subsets of your parameter space data. So again, you have this decision rule from the sample space to the action space. It's all about decision making. That's why we have this decision theory as a general framework for many statistical methods. Okay. So these are the basic settings. A um, few more, one more remark. This decision rule, which we usually call delta, we set as a function from the sample space x to the action space a. But in fact, this is kind of deterministic. So you only choose one from the set of decisions that you have. But, you know, you can be sort of um, a random person and say, uh, take, this, take the usual example about where you want to go for your holiday. You can, you can say, okay, um, I'm gonna flip a coin to decide whether I go to Europe or go to Asia, but I'm definitely not staying in UK. So, you kind of assign a distribution on the action space. And when that case happens, we call your decision rule a randomized decision rule. Um, the strict definition, the rigorous definition of randomized decision rule requires measure theory. Um, how many of you have taken measure theory before? Yeah, so I'm not gonna go through it because it's kind of mind blowing, but th the concept is simple. We assign a probability distribution to the action space like this. And don't worry, this um, randomized decision rule will not appear again anywhere in the lecture notes. So you don't have to worry about this. So we only consider the deterministic decision rules. Now, we know all those um, point estimation, interval estimation, hypothesis, nest testing are about making decisions. So one thing is how do we assess whether your decision is good or not. This can be a very vague question, but we can formalize it by defining a loss function of between theta and your decision A. So this is a function from the unordered pair uh, parameter space and action space to any real number that's positive. Just to say, um, only positive loss makes sense because uh, negative loss sounds weird. By the way, this is unordered, so it can may, maybe in the lecture notes it's L A theta or, but the order doesn't matter. Okay. So, what is a loss function? It kind of measures how far your decision is from the true parameter theta. I mean, oh. By the way, this is the case of a point estimation. So in point estimation, we could have the square loss, which is, so your loss of your decision, which 
in point estimation, your decision A is the estimator. So we can say the loss is theta minus theta x squared. It's the, this is the squared loss. You can see it's a Euclidean distance between the two points. Uh, of course, you can also define the absolute value, the absolute error, which is theta minus Value. This is also another loss function. So yes, the choice of loss function. Any question? Okay, that's fine. The choice of loss function can be arbitrary. You can choose any other functions you like. For hypothesis testing, we also have a loss function, which is okay. So for hypothesis testing, your loss is a test, um, the five. So we're actually asking, and the, and the true, it's not the true parameter anymore, it's the, whether it's h0 or h1. Um, I'm still gonna use theta. Bear in mind that theta is either zero or one, which represents either the null hypothesis is true or the alternative hypothesis is true. And the loss function that we are gonna define is the very simple one. So, what does this mean? This is an indicator function on the event theta not equal to phi. Which means, it basically says, if you are not making the good de right decision about hypothesis, the loss is one. If your, if your decision is correct, then it's zero. Say if the true, if the null hypothesis is true, and your decision rule gives you zero, then you make a correct decision, so the loss is zero. It's such, as simple as that. Uh, by the way, um, if you know type 1 and type 2 error, this loss function is simply type 1 error plus type 2 error probabilities. As for the interval estimation, the loss function is a bit difficult to define. Um, but there are papers online and you can see my auxiliary notes. I put some papers in there. I'm not going to go through this. The focus of this course is mainly on point decision, de decision theory in point estimation and decision theory in hypothesis testing. So, now let's explicitly study the loss of a decision rule. A decision rule, as we said before, it is a function on the, so you take a data and then you make a decision. So, you can see here, this is the main loss that we're going to study today. Um, there are two unknown things here. Uh, not unknown, there are two random things here if you view from different perspectives. The x, the x can be to some extent random um, because it is the data. So if you think x is random, uh, you're kind of taking the frequentist's view in the statistics. And if you are in the Bayesian, if you take Bayesian view, you think, okay, theta is also random. That kind of restricts us to measuring the quality of the decision rule. Because we, kind of, we want a quality measure, let's say a Q for quality measure, Q delta. We want something in this form ultimately. So our goal from now is going to be remove the randomness in theta and remove randomness in x. Is that clear? The goal of this lecture. Because now we're gonna officially begin drawing the, the big diagram um, that I put in the auxiliary notes about the whole, all the risk functions that you should know about decision theory. And they come from removing the randomness in X and theta. So, step one. Um, let's first, <coughs> wait, let's The first thing I can do is just take a simple frequentist view. Because we have our function, our um, distribution, not, the, not distribution, we have our model on the, on the data, which is um, something from the, so we have kind of a family of distributions that we think our data has this distribution. It can be an ex exponential family, where well, f theta is the PDF of the exponential family. It can be other things. Yes, so if we take this frequentist view, 
and remove randomness in X. You can simply take the expectation. Um, this X following distribution at theta of this quantity, which means we are measuring the average loss across samples. The average loss for different data points that you can collect, possibly collect. Then you get the so-called risk, the frequentist risk function. So yes, we have removed the randomness in X. And this is the risk. So the next step is to further remove randomness in theta. But before doing that, I just want to mention that um, some, some decision rules are so bad that like they are doing bad for every value of theta, so we remove them. For example, if you have decision, decision rule one, decision rule two, you can clearly see that no matter what value of theta you take, this one, decision rule two, has lower risk than decision rule one. So which one, like, you should, you should throw one of them, you know that. Which one should you throw away? One. Yes, that's a one, because they always have a higher risk. We don't want higher risk. We want always the lower risk. So in this case, we say this is inadmissible. So strict, strict definition of inadmissibility actually doesn't require it always be strictly lower. It can be, it can overlap at some regions. But there must be at least one region that is strictly less. Otherwise, you just have two um, equal decision rules, which we cannot make. Um, sorry. Otherwise, you just have two equal risks. And in that case, you don't want to throw one of them. But here, definitely, we want to throw level one. Yeah, that's about throwing things. So if we put all them aside, um, still you, you have many, many decision rules that you cannot throw away. For example, if all the decision rules are like this, um, some areas one is better, some area like, for this area definitely, this one has the lowest risk. Here, um, here is this one having lowest risk. And here is this one having lowest risk. So you cannot choose. Therefore, we must further remove the randomness theta. And one method is to consider the worst case scenario, which is the largest risk you can find on the, um, among all the thetas. Um, let's say we have a decision, we have a, let's say we have a risk function like this. And you can see this is the worst case scenario. So you call this, you call this risk the max risk. And then, okay, so this is one root. Supremum of theta in the sample space of this risk function is the max risk. But apart from taking the worst case scenario, you can also take the average, which is another good measure. That makes sense. So this is the, this average risk is actually called what we are going to call a Bayes risk. Um, but before doing that, the calculation of average actually requires putting a distribution of theta, and we know putting a distribution of theta is about choosing the prior pi. So how does this affect our average? So our pi can have, um, so if this is the pi, it can have lower value somewhere and a higher value somewhere, which basically means you want more weight for data points around this region, and you want less weight for the two sides. So your average kind of mainly depends on data around here. But then if you choose another prior, the average may be a little bit different. So yes, choice of prior does matter. But now let's just assume we have picked a prior pi. Then we can calculate the 
bias risk by taking the expectation for theta following the prior pi. And if you're, by the way, if you're not sure um, what these symbols mean, they are just like putting integrals onto this um, loss function um, against, this one is against x, this one is integrating for theta. So after two rounds of integration, you finally obtain something that is only dependent on the decision rule. I don't worry about the pi here because I said we choose a prior and then we find its rule. So once you have chosen the prior, this only depends on your decision rule. So this can be used as a quality measure that was our target in the beginning. This is one of the quality measure. And by the way, this max risk actually doesn't depend on theta because you have found the maximum point. So this is also a quality measure. And given the quality measure, we want the one with lowest risk. So the minimizer of this function, the rule that minimizes this function is called the Bayes rule, which is the best decision rule in terms of Bayes risk. And this, you can minimize it, you get the so-called minimax rule, which is the best rule in terms, in the sense of lowest max risk. So this is something like a mean of the decision rule in the action space of the max rule. Um, risk. And this one is like some integral of theta x for the loss. I'm going to miss some details here, but the key is both of these, uh, finding both of these, oh sorry, this is the, that's the risk. involves two layer of optimizations, which can be hard. Even one layer is kind of troublesome, and then you add another layer of, of um, optimization will make things messy. And another thing is minimizing decision rule is because usually you have um, your action space is not that a is not that a simple space. It could be um, in the point estimation is the whole parameter space. So these two optimizations, optimizations, optimizations are on different spaces, which can cause a lot of troubles. But here, you have only have one layer of optimization. So calculating this one is definitely easier than this one. And later we will, later we will show how to use a Bayes rule to find the minimax rule. Minimax rule still it's still important because it considers the worst case scenario. In the in reality, you never know whether the true parameter is around that worst case scenario. So we kind of want to make sure everything is nice and low. Okay, one small remark. I said about choice of prior before. Um, so there are good choices of prior and bad choices. Um, when we say bad choices, we basically mean um, so the bias risk of one pi. If if your prior if your prior pi is always you know should be the other way around if your if your prior pi slash always gives a higher risk than any other priors, then this is called least favorable prior.
Yes, and um, usually we want to avoid getting that prior because this is the this gives the highest risk among all the other priors. But later we will show that actually um, the only way that you can get you can find minimax using Bayes is to use some least favorable prior. But that's a topic for later. Okay, so we have introduced this route. There is another route, which I'm going to talk about later. Just um, leave that blank for, uh, as um, to cure your curiosity. Okay, so we have two. We sort of have three types of rules. One is minimax rule, one is Bayes rule, and one is admissible rule. Admissible rules are in, not inadmissible rules. So these three rules are all good. What are their relationships? This is what we are going to study now. Okay, so let's first study the Minimax and Bayes. Because I said earlier that you can use Bayes rule to find minimax. And here's the reason. Let's say we you have fixed a decision rule and that is risk function. So you have your max risk here and uh, sort of just assume the average is around here, which is the Bayes which is the Bayes risk. So, yeah, it's trivial from the graph that the bias risk must be always smaller than the maximum risk. It's also from the definition. So, if, and, and think of the meaning of a Bayes risk. Um, a Bayes risk of the Bayes um, estimator It is the smallest among all the Bayes risk of all other decision rules. So, if you have a way to sort of ensure that your max risk is even lower than this one, um, let's say you you want to. You want to find a, let's say you have obtained a Bayes rule and you want to find a minimax decision rule delta zero. And if you can somehow make sure that the max risk of this decision rule is always smaller than that of the, the bias risk, then you can ensure, you know, that because maximum, maximum risk is actually always larger than the bias rule. So for any other decision rule of theta, the max risk is greater than this one, which is greater than this one by the definition of bias rule, and is ultimately greater than this one. And once you establish such an equation, such a chain of inequality, you know this is the minimax because it minimizes any maximum risk. And all of these things are just based on a very simple observation that max risk is always greater than equal to the base. Yeah. That's one theorem in the or lemma in the lecture notes. So um, this is guaranteed by the definition. This is guaranteed by the definition. All you have to make sure is this one. This is your condition for this to establish. Okay, um, let's consider one case that this could happen, which is basically in your, let, let's say, now we want to adjust, now we want to, so we are too lazy to pick this data zero. 
So I'm just saying, I'm gonna let delta zero be delta bias, which is the bias rule that we have already found. And we wanna see whether this is a minimax rule as well. So we wanna see whether the bias risk rule is a minimax rule. So if you find the above theorem, if you can make sure that this is always, so that the, the bias risk always attends the max risk, then that holds, right? Because we chose data zero to be data bias. And now, if this is satisfied, we have that this is minimax. So think of what this means on this graph. You are sort of requiring that your average of your risk function equals the maximum. And when can that happen? When would the average of a function equals its maximum? Sorry? Yes, exactly. Think of just squeezing those lines and kind of squeezing the average, kind of pulls everything above, and then it, it just, the final result you get is kind of always like something like a constant risk. And um, this is, yeah, this is basically when you have the maximum risk the base risk always attaining the maximum, which is this equation here. And you know that guarantees you that this is um, also the minimax. So um, this is equivalent to ensuring that all, for every theta, the risk is lower than the bias risk. Which this is the formulation in the lecture notes. However, I have to stress that this is not the only case. Because what I'm drawing the average here is using the uniform prior. But okay, even if you were just using the uniform prior, you can have a different function that also has maximum equals average. which is my favorite technique in measure theory, digging holes on your, on your line. If you dig a hole like that, it's kind of, um, it's, it's, the, the, the definition is that if you dig a hole at point A, and you say the function uh, x, fx equals, um, say that's one for x not equals A, and 0.5 for x equals A. When you dig a hole like that, your average is still one. Makes sense, right? I don't have to prove this. Yeah, that makes sense, right? So yes, this is not the only case. You can have holes, as many holes as you like. Um, what we say in this case is that, so if we, if we say um, the set of theta if we call the set of theta, um, which attends where the risk attends the max, we can call that um, omega. In measure theory, digging holes like that is kind of saying that the the measure of Um, okay, let's say the measure is of this set omega is zero. And so if you can ensure, I'm oh sorry, it should be the set not attaining the maximum. So in this case, it's omega basically equals the set A because it's just a point. And kind of the measure of zero kind of means that you have length zero. Yes, a point has length zero, so your measure is zero, and then you are fine with this condition. So your bias rule is still a minimax. But the, the problem is, if you have such, if you use, um, oh, by the way, if 
you use other priors, um, and your prior sort of and your prior doesn't always isn't always be positive. If it looks like this, if you choose such a prior, it kind of means that I want to throw all all other value data here. So in this case, no matter what the risk behave on this region, it doesn't matter. That kind of means, you know, if your risk function is like this, it is constant on the range of support of the prior pi, then then your risk will still satisfy max equals bias. Makes sense, right? So in this case, instead of saying the measure of the set omega equals zero, we say we say pi of omega equals zero. Uh, it basically means, you know, on this on the region where pi has positive density, it has almost constant risk. By almost constant, I mean including these cases where we decompose. Okay. Um, but the problem is, if this condition is satisfied, your prior is the least favorable prior we mentioned before, which you don't want to choose. So it's a sacrifice. You sacrifice the probability of getting other priors, of using other priors to further minimize the risk um, by avoiding the calculation of the two-layer optimization here. Is that clear? And um, I'm gonna skip this proof because it's just another channel in inequality level practice. And then you can prove that um, such prior is uh, the least favorable part. So the, the, the way you do the proof is choose any other prior that pi slash, and you prove that it always gives a, a, slow, a lower risk. questions so far? No question? Okay, let's continue. After studying this, we sort of have the question of whether the Bayes estimate, the Bayes rule that you just found is admissible or not. Because we said if, if there is a case like this, you want to throw this inadmissible decision rule. So the Bayes rule you found is kind of useless. We want to know when our decision rule is useful. That's the question we're going to study. So about, um, about admissibility is about whether you can find another decision rule where your risk is always lower. But Kind of from the definition of the bias, from the, of the bias rule, if it's already the minimizer of that bias risk, which is the average risk for the, for the whole function. So if you have a unique bias rule, then it, it actually guarantees that your, the rule you find is admissible. So what's the problem of not being unique? And again, let's dig this hole. So you have two functions, and their average are exactly the same. And this is the bias risk. So they can both be the bias rule. But 
actually beats that rule. Because only at this very single hole that we just did, it has lower risk. So by our definition of admissibility, this is inadmissible. Because of the non-uniqueness of bias rule. What if, mm, let's say, when, is this admissible, to be honest? Um, actually, no. Because we can dig any, as many holes as we like. So if you put yourself in a situation where you cannot make sure the bias risk is unique, but the bias rule is unique, then you always suffer from the problem of someone being able to dig your big holes in your function. Um, and kind of makes your the estimator or the rule that you just found inadmissible. So in order for it to be admissible, criteria one is being unique by its rule. And there is another case. So let's consider um, if So suppose you can find the other risk, and suppose you can find um, another law which has lower risk, but, so, so the way of, the, the second criteria is sort of avoiding people from digging holes on your functions, because digging holes on your function, on your risk function, breaks continuity. So if we say your risk must be continuous. And no one would ever be able to dig a hole. So the only way they can beat your risk function of your, of your um, bias estimator is, is by picking a whole region that is lower than your function instead of digging holes. And that causes problems. Because if you dig such a large region out, your average gets lower, which contradicts the fact that so average of first function will be here, average of the another function must be lower, which breaks the assumption that you said you picked a bias estimator. So that also ensures your bias rule is admissible. But, okay, okay. There is another way that people can beat your estimator in this situation, which is by assigning zero probability, zero pi probability on the region that is different. Because then, you know, this part is not taking, part, taking role in the calculation of the average risk, which is the bias risk. So, your average remains the same for the two functions. Then you still you are at, it doesn't contradict the fact that this is bias rule, bias rule, but you have another rule which gives you lower risk function, and that means your rule is inadmissible. So apart from requiring the risk to be continuous, we also require pi to have positive density. Um, with respect to the best measure. It, it sounds very fancy, but actually it's, the meaning is very simple. So pi having positive density means that whenever you take an interval, whether it's open or closed, as long as you have the interval is not like a, a point, then pi has positive density. That, that means Pi is positive, has positive density with respect to the, the best measure. So yeah, yeah, if E tries to dig a large hole to beat your your S your, your your rule, then he would like this must be an interval in this case, in to ensure that the risk function is continuous. We can define the difference. Difference, difference equals difference theta equals R bias. This is bias risk of your bias rule minus 
minus the S measure that he found that he tried to beat you. And that difference function, because this is continuous, this is continuous, so the difference function is continuous. So if you need a this if you need a difference, then it must be an interval on an interval. And that makes the density positive, which sort of ensures that his estimator will have a lower average risk compared to yours, which contradicts the fact that you said you found an estimator which minimizes the rule, the average risk. So with these two conditions, your bias estimator is always admissible. Is that clear? For the strict mathematical proof, please see the lecture notes or my notes. One small remark, if you want to prove something like a unique bias rule must be admissible, proving this directly is actually difficult. Because we didn't define what this means by, we, we define admissible, but by taking the negative of this. So we defined admissible to be inadmissible. Therefore, for this kind of proofs, you have to take the contrapositive approach. So you, you reverse this argument and take and put a not in, in front. So not admissible implies not unique bias rule. This will be equivalent to unique bias rule is admissible. And only if you put this into this form, you can begin because when you see not admissible, it's inadmissible, and then you can write you know, the inequalities used to define inadmissibility. This sure, like, uh, this is always smaller than you could have another one with some exists some data such that one is strictly less than the other. And when you after you write those inequalities, you can start to do your proof. So um, in the same way, you can prove the theorem in the lecture notes, saying that if you have an admissible rule um, with constant risk, and it is minimax. The idea is very similar to what we did before. Um, so the requirement of constant risk sort of um, ensures that the, the risk function is always the same as the max function, max, max risk, um, then ensuring that um, admissible, because admissible estimator has the smallest, I should say there's no smaller risk function than this, so that means there's no smaller risk function with lower max risk. Then it means admissible admissible rule is minimax rule. The idea is, yeah, really just the same as what we talked through. So this proof you can try on your own. I'm not going to go through this. Only one thing that we didn't complete on this graph is the Posterior risk. So we said before that we have we want to measure uh, your quality of the decision rule by kind of minimizing this loss function. Of, but the loss function has randomness in theta and x. So we we were removing the randomness by first removing the randomness in x. But why we have to do that? We can do the other way around. We can remove the randomness in theta first. But remember. If you are removing the randomness in theta first, your x is there. So you should fully utilize all the information. Therefore, you need to take the um, you need to take the posterior mean. 
of this loss function. Because the data is there. But still, we, we, we face the challenge of choosing the prior. Just that in this case. Yes, and after taking this, you have your um, post, what we call posterior risk, which really makes sense. It's um, from the posterior distribution. Um, um, in lecture notes, it's denoted lambda pi of this. Okay, now you are thinking, oh, how am I going to remove the randomness in x here? Sorry, it's impossible. Because, as we said before, you assume the distribution of x to depend on theta. And now you remove the randomness of theta. So, you don't know the distribution of x. This is called sort of like, um, in the lecture notes, I think he noted as fx. Um, semicolon theta. The semicolon means distribution of x is um, given based on theta. So if you don't have these theta, you have to, if you want to go this step, you have to know the full distribution of x, which is the non-parametric model. But you don't have it here. So this rule is that. Does that mean the posterior risk that we just defined is useless? Apparently, apparently no. If it's useless, it's not going to appear in the lecture notes. So, why is it useful? Let's study this risk, um, the bias risk in detail. So, this is the bias risk that we defined before. And two, I said it's two layer. It's, um, it's found by removing the randomness in both the parameter and the um, sample. So, we have a two layer integration. Um, now let's try to break it into single layers. So this function, this is the joint distribution of x and theta. Um, we can write it in two ways. There are two ways to decompose it. The first way is the well-known Bayes approach. This likelihood function is prior, and if we multiply them together, you get the joint distribution. Um, this is basically f theta x. So with that decomposition, we have because pi theta doesn't depend on x, so we can throw it out, and then we have this integral. Okay, this. Lovely little expression here is what we have already defined because look at it. It's sorry, I'm missing a term here. Um, I should put the f theta x here. So you are by doing this, you are basically taking expectation for x using the model you have. So this is the risk. Then you see the outer layer is basically taking expectation with respect to prior distribution that we define on theta. So this whole expression gives you the uh, bias risk. But we, there is another way to decompose, decompose this joint probability is by taking the posterior distribution and leaving this um, px long. So you can take px out of this integral and then you get the second integral decomposition. Um, it should be pi posterior times the loss function. Ah, Px is here. Okay, this is unknown. That's why we said the second route was not possible. You cannot calculate the bias rules with this bias risk with this decomposition, but you can see something useful from, useful from here. So this is the posterior risk. 
because you are taking an integral on theta using the density function, the posterior density. So this is the posterior risk. And you can see that, and you can see that if you're, so the, the so if your decision rule, let me write them, oh, here is his x theta. So if your decision rule can ensure that this is the smallest among all x, If your decision rule can make sure this is minimized among all x, and then you integrate it, it's still going to be minimal. So, if, uh, if by the way, minimizer of posterior risk is called the then name for this. Let's just call it posterior rule. Posterior rule minimizes posterior risk. And if it does so for every x, then it is Bayes rule. Because integration doesn't change inequalities. Uh, because p is positive. It is a dis unknown distribution, but it must be positive. So we have this very useful implication, and with this implication, um, this implication basically means that you can find bias rule by finding posterior rule, which is way more easier because you calculate bias rule with this equation one, which is which has two layers of integration, but this one only has one layer of integration. It's very easy to calculate. Then you minimize it, um, fix by fixing the x, you minimize it, and then the minimizer is guaranteed to the bias rule. So that's why we leave this risk here, even though we cannot calculate the bias rules using this. But this can be used to find the bias rule. Let's give an example. Uh, is that clear, right? Uh, the, the reason why we need to leave posterior risk there. Okay. Okay. So, the example we are going to give is using a loss function, which is the, oh, we're doing point estimation here. Um, so the loss function for your estimator from the true parameter is the square loss. And let's first consider its um, risk. By calculating the risk, we need to take the expectation with respect to x. Mm, let's not worry about this um, distribution first. So, this is the expectation of theta minus theta hash squared. Does that look familiar? Variance. Yes? Variance. It is um, it, it's very close to variance, but... Square loss. Um, so, this is square loss. What is the expectation of the square loss? It's the mean squares. Uh, sorry, mean, mean squared error. Yes. So, yeah, you have a mean squared error as a risk. Then you try to find the bias risk, which is you have to take expectation with respect to the prior for the MSE of your, um, of your estimated theta hat. And then, in order to find the um, Bias rule, you need to minimize this. So look at how messy this is, yeah? Minimize this expression among the action space. You have a MSE, you have E pi, you have minimization. That's gonna drive you crazy. If you try to calculate this one and minimize it, like um, as Professor George did in his lecture, you see how difficult it is, right? So that's why we need the posterior rule. Um, there's no strict definition of posterior rule, but yes. If we use the posterior risk, it's going to be way more easier. So, posterior rule goes back to this. 
and then we find the posterior rule by taking the expectation, um, taking expectation with respect to the posterior distribution, which is basically this. Oh, that's much cleaner, right? And then, you know, um, the thing is here, um, so because theta is unknown. So we, we kind of want to pull it away from theta hat. Um, although, but although theta is unknown, let's suppose we have picked a prior, so fix prior. Actually, if you fix the prior, actually, this is going to be known, which is the posterior mean of theta. So we use this as a bridge to separate these two parameters. So we can write this as pi theta hat minus mu x plus mu x minus theta squared. These two are going to be the same. And by doing this, we can separate you know, this part with this part. And then you pull away the unknown theta from the theta hat. So now you can completely focus on your decision rule theta hat. Because this part really it doesn't depend on theta hat. And after a bunch of calculations, you end up in this expression. I'm not going to go through the details of the calculations. So you have this quantity, which is just a square, you know, something there. And this quantity is the posterior variance. Because it doesn't depend on your decision rule, so when minimizing, you just need to consider this term. What's the minimizer of this term? Yeah, posterior mean. Yeah, very easy, right? Just three lines of calculations get you there. And if you try to calculate that, that takes like whole, the whole board to do so. So you need posterior risk. Now we have that under the square loss, the um, bias rule is always the posterior mean. Okay, so that finish that finishes our um, roadmap, which is this one. And using that helps you to remember all the risks, how they are defined, what do they mean. So we learned, as a summary, we learned um, ways of removing randomness in the risk in the loss function. That we, so we want to measure the quality of the decision rule. Then we use many ways to remove randomness, and then we end up in kind of three for four um, good rules that we define. Minimax rule, bias rule, uh, being admissible rule, and the posterior rule. And then we investigated the relationship between them. So minimax rule, not easy to calculate. Bias rule, not easy to calculate. Posterior rule, easy to calculate. And then we have a nice implication chain that bias posterior rule is the bias rule, is the minimax rule under certain regularity conditions that we talked before. So yes, the approach, is, although you have so many risk functions <coughs> defined, the approach is always to start with the post. Um, the approach is always try to verify the um, conditions that we discussed before. For example, these two conditions um, and some other conditions. Um, and then if the conditions are satisfied, you start with the posterior rule and then go as far as you can to see how good this rule actually is. Now we're gonna, as, before we finish, we're gonna talk about the application of decision rule in the Bayes statistics. So, um, suppose you have a bunch of, suppose you have a bunch of random variables, samples taken from the Bernoulli with parameter theta, and then you, you, you think that theta satisfies a uh, prior, which is theta r plus theta. But kind of previously, we were struggling about the choice of r from beta. Unless you have really good knowledge, usually you don't have, and it's kind of hard to say the physical meaning of r from beta here. Um, then, however, with decision theory, 
So if you think the lo if you use the loss function, the square loss, we talk we have already proved that under this prior the and this loss function, the best rule, which is the bias rule, is the posterior mean. So what is the posterior mean here? Well, actually, um, I'm not going to go through the details, but you know how to do this. The posterior distribution is beta alpha plus stigma xi, beta plus m minus stigma xi, which is basically saying we add the number of successes to variable alpha, we add the number of failures to variable beta. Okay. So what's the posterior um, mean? The posterior mean is, correct me if I'm wrong, I think this is the case. That should be the posterior mean. Yeah, because mean of theta is the um, alpha over alpha plus theta. And then if you want to find the good rule, we, we talked about before um, that uh, your Bayes, if your Bayes rule is con has constant risk, then it is quite good, it is minimax as well, and it is admissible. So we want to make sure that um, this is the risk. So You want to find alpha and beta such that the posterior mean is constant. Oh, sorry, it's not the, not the posterior mean. To be the bias risk of the posterior mean is constant. So the risk, bias risk are high. So this guides you through the choice of alpha and beta. Even if you know nothing about this parameter beta before, you still can get a reasonably decent um, choice of prior. That actually solved our struggle. This is one application. Another application is in hypothesis testing. So I think you all, if you if you haven't looked at the lecture, it's fine. Um, so there's a like an, a theorem called Neyman Poisson, which basically says that um, the likelihood ratio test has the um, is is the best um, in the sense that it minimizes the minimizes the chances of making type 1 and type, root, uh, type 2 error together. So, but for, if you want to give such a theorem directly, you need to kind of investigate through all the possible tests that are in the literature and, and, and so, somehow infer that um, you have to take a guess that likely the original test is better. But if you're using decision theory, you don't have to make any guess, just like the prior prior choosing case. You just have to define a decent loss function, um, like the loss is A times the probability of making type one error, and B times, by the way, these are just um, constants that um, sort of, so A and B quantifies how important you, you think you should minimize type one error, type two error. If you choose a higher A than B, then you think type one error is more serious. And if you define such a loss function, and then you calculate um, using decision rule, the risks that we just found, you calculate the posterior risk. Um, sorry, you calculate the posterior mean, which is the Bayes rule. And then you try to find the minimizer. And then, surprisingly, you will find that it takes the form of like a visual test. And it, um, it's all like in the lecture notes section. So, note section 
Um, it's just a bunch of calculations. I'm not going to go through it, but it doesn't require any prior, like any anything about choosing the test. It will automatically give you a test, which is awesome. So decision theory is very useful for making decisions in statistics, and it kind of it's it's kind of an automatic scheme to choose the right thing for you. So you don't have to bother about choosing your own priors, choosing your own tests. And that's all for decision theory. So thank you very much for coming today.